Hi, welcome back. So, so far we've been talking about definite integrals, where there are bounds on the integral. We're looking at the area under the curve between a specific set of points, like from A to B. And today I want to talk about the indefinite integral and what that means. So, because the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that finding a definite integral is equivalent to finding an antiderivative, and then evaluating at the endpoints, that's that f of b minus f of a thing that we've seen before. We now can just say that we use the integral symbol to represent finding the antiderivative. So that integral that we've been using, that sign, the swishy s thing, we're going to use that to represent finding the antiderivative. So now if I just draw that integral symbol with no bounds on it of a function f of x dx, then I can say this is equal to big F of x where big F is an antiderivative of F. So specifically, there are no bounds here on this integral, and this is just indicating to me, find an antiderivative of little f. So in the past, when you've done problems where you had to find the antiderivative and it was just asked of you, we're now going to replace that instruction, find the antiderivative, with this integral symbol to represent find the antiderivative. So just like d dx means take the derivative of, or the prime notation means take the derivative of, now the integral symbol is just going to mean find the integral of. Okay, so hopefully you'll see how this gets used a little better when we do some examples at the end of the video, but really quickly I just want to give you some notes. So first off, when we do the definite integral from a to b of f, this is a number. We're finding an area under the curve, so we're getting some sort of constant value. But when we use the indefinite integral of f of x, we're getting a function because we're getting an antiderivative. And that antiderivative, the values are going to change depending on x in lots of cases. So when we do the indefinite integral and we find the antiderivative, we want to use the plus c at the end to represent any antiderivative, so to represent the general case. So just remember, if there are no bounds, you should have a function and you should use a plus c at the end. Okay, let's try some examples. Okay, so let's do an example of an indefinite integral, and I'm going to compare it to a definite integral just to show you the difference between indefinite and definite and what your answers will look like. So let's evaluate the integral of x dx, and we'll evaluate the definite integral of from 2 to 5 of x dx. So for the indefinite integral, we're just looking for an antiderivative. So the antiderivative of x is 1 half x squared, and we're gonna add that plus c at the end to represent any antiderivative. And remember, that plus c is there because the derivative of a constant, plus c, is always zero. So there could be any constant there. Okay, so now let's compare this to the definite integral. So I'm gonna use the fundamental theorem of calculus here. I find an antiderivative, one half x squared, and I'm evaluating it at the bounds from two to five. So this is how we have done these problems previously but I just want to comment that you really could put the plus c here and it's not going to change your answer. We tend to not write it because it doesn't have any effect, but let me show you why. So if we put a plus c in and then we evaluate the bounds, I'm putting in five for x, one half five squared plus c, and I'm subtracting what happens when I put in two for x, one half two squared plus c. So I'm getting 25 over two plus c minus the whole quantity 4 over 2 plus c. When I distribute and simplify this, my c's are going to cancel, so really that plus c was unnecessary. It's not needed for definite integrals because it cancels out. Then, putting the remainder of my terms together, I'm getting 21 over 2 as my definite integral. So, just to highlight, we get a number for the definite integral, and we get a function with a plus c for the indefinite integral. All right, so with antiderivatives and using the integral sign to represent them, I want to just remind you of some antiderivative rules, this time written with the indefinite integral or with the integral symbol. So we can say the integral of x to the n dx is equal to 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1, and then we have our plus c. So here, this works because of power rule, the n plus one comes down in front when we take its derivative, we decrease the exponent by one, and I'm getting one times x to the n, since those n plus ones would cancel. But hopefully you can see how these are related here. Then, if we are taking the integral of a dx, 
where a is just some constant, I'm going to get a times x plus c. So here we just add that x in. That's because the derivative of a times x is just a. All right, then we can do the integral of e to the x dx. This is just e to the x. And I forgot my plus c there. There should be a plus c there. Even the best of us forget our plus c's. Try not to forget it as often as you can. I forget sometimes too. So this is because the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. So the same thing works for the antiderivative. Antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x plus c. Okay, then we can do the integral of 1 over x dx. This is the natural log of absolute value of x plus c. Putting that absolute value there is like the technically mathematically correct thing to do, but we often don't write it, so don't worry about that too much. But this is because the derivative of natural log is 1 over x. Then we can do some trig functions. So the integral of cosine is just sine plus c. The integral of negative sine is cosine plus c. That's because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Then the integral of secant squared is tangent. So these are just rules for our sine, cosine, and tangent derivatives, but now written as antiderivatives. Okay, so that's just some of our more simple antiderivative rules. We're gonna learn a lot of ways to solve integral problems, but these are just our basic ones that come from our basic rules for derivatives. Okay, and to wrap up this video, I just wanna review some integral vocabulary. So if we have the integral of f of x dx, the f of x, or what's ever in that position, is the integrand. This is just the function that's being integrated. So just know that word integrand represents the thing we're integrating. Then the dx is the differential. This just tells us the variable we are integrating with respect to. So in single variable calculus, this doesn't really apply too much. It doesn't matter all that much because we usually only have one variable. So it's not too important to indicate that we're using dx, that x is our variable, since there's only one variable to think about. But this becomes important in multivariable calculus when we start integrating with multiple variables. So if we're integrating with x and y's involved, you have to say if we're integrating with respect to x or with respect to y. Think about implicit differentiation, where you have to do that y prime or the dy dx. It was important to know which variable was which. Then just one more thing. So the variables in the integral, we call them dummy variables, and they're interchangeable. So interchangeable meaning that if I have f of x dx, I could rewrite this as f of t dt, or f of y dy, as long as I'm changing the variables consistently. So it's just meant to say f of x, we're writing x as the variable, and then we're integrating with respect to that variable x. So just know that you might see problems with different variables, and that doesn't really change the process. We're just using different variables to shake things up sometimes. Okay, so that is the basics of indefinite integrals. From now on, you can just assume that if you see an integral sign, you are being asked to find an antiderivative. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.